What I want us to do today is to um, understand my theory or hypothesis as to what will happen to images in the age of AI generation. Specifically, I want to focus on their telos or their goal. Um, through this talk or essay, we'll come to understand that images want to take over the world, hence their treachery. The pictorial flippening will also represent the point at which the images in the data sets, unless selected otherwise, will be in majority from AI-generated images, thus making the models recursive, mirrors of their own creations. The artificial will no longer try to mimic the human-made, but this new amalgam of network-made and human-made. The blurring will be complete, and the modern world will be precipitated into a permanent state of hyperreal where images will no longer be tethered to a human maker. To ritualize a network is to ritualize the communications between machines and machines, to ritualize images made for and by machines. It is to imagine a world no longer centered on humans. And this world is the telos of the AI image, hence their treachery. So this is an, uh, an essay called The Treachery of Images. It is in the Blombos Caves in South Africa that humans made their first pictorial gesture. Now imagine these rocks, you know, broken down, convex, splattered with um, red ochre. Homo sapiens living 73,000 years ago used ochre to make abstract drawings on the rocks. Whereas regular engravings may have been disputed, brushed off as remnants of tool sharpening or accidents, the use of pigments show the intentionality in that gesture. A continent away in Spain, 65,000 years ago, Neanderthals were also discovering the power of representation. Their medium was, a cave, was cave walls on which they drew ladder-shaped figures, dots, and handprints. This was our first way to represent the world, images. Despite their primacy in the history of visual communication, images have not always had a good reputation. Um, and this is an important point that I want to make as we think about, um, this is an aside, but you mentioned Sora that was just released. I think a lot of the conversations around um, video generation models like Sora, or um, you can use now Pika, or even Runway, is um, their sort of understood attack on reality from the moment when I can put myself in a place where I was not, or put another individual in a situation where they were not, um, and the line between what is identifiable as generated and, and what is not, um, reality becomes under attack because these images can be disseminated quite rapidly, especially with the internet. And it's not just a matter of being able to create, I don't know if you saw the demo, but just like these cool images of women walking around in Japan but also the consequences on the overall structure of media and the visual um, dissemination of, of images in our culture. Um, so the downstream effects are these reconsider this reconsideration of reality. And what's interesting to me is that it brings forth the actual nature of the image, namely that the image was ever meant to represent reality. We know that now when we put the prompt in, that it's not an actual person walking in Japan. But, as I'll go on to say, the picture from Henri Cartier Bresson, or the image from Daido Moriyama, also was not a pure representation of reality. It was framed, things were selected, things were put in and put out. And that framing, this act of image making, this pretense of representation is, in and of itself, a folly. Many cultures advocated for iconoclasm, or even iconophobia, the belief that images should be destroyed. And this was often directed at the interdiction of representation of sacred figures like prophets, saints, and gods. Certain groups went as far as to prohibit all representation of living things in Islam. Uh, the hadiths, for instance, can be exe exe exegeted to oppose all images of the Prophet in Book 63, uh, the Hadith 110, and Book 67, Hadith 5181. It is reported to have said that 
angels would not enter a house where there are pictures. Um, and uh, in uh, early Christianity, Canon 36 of the Council of Elvira says, pictures are not to be placed in churches so that they not become objects of worship or, or of adoration. Iconoclasts at the time sensed that images were dangerous, perhaps even treacherous, to borrow René Magritte's term. René Magritte's painting, The Treachery of Images, which you can now imagine, um, famous with both the pipe and the inscription, Ceci n'est pas une pipe. When asked about the sentence, which means this is not a pipe, when asked about the sentence, Magritte replied, could you stuff my pipe? No, it's representation, is it not? One of the best, one of the best modern criticisms of images comes from Wilhelm Fusser, uh, the Brazilian Czech-born philosopher, writer, and journalist. In his essay, Towards the Philosophy of Photography, Fusser de de deconstructs the role of images in a world where their production is mechanized by the camera. Though he passed too early to witness the rise of image, uh, images generated by neural networks, we can use his thoughts to provide an updated working framework of the telos of the uh, AI-generated image. Why are images so dangerous, according to Flusser? Briefly, an event occurs at the act of image production, whereby the connection between the maker and the image evanesces. I quote Flusser. Essentially, this is a question of amnesia. Humans being, human beings forget they created the image in order to orient, orientate themselves in the world. Imagination has turned into hallucination. He very, very strangely uses the term now we, we use to describe um, AI's uh, sort of lying or saying the, the wrong thing. In his opinion, we misconstrue images thinking that they are screens or representations of the world, when in fact, um, when they are maps. And this misattribution leads to a lack of criticality towards them. We are repeating the same philosophical behavior with AI-generated images. Too often, discussions concerning uh, products like McJourney, DALI, stable diffusions are about the quality of the result, its humanness or lack therefore of how much rep you know how much it looks like uh, early 2000s deviant art. And um, um, we can lean on Kant here um, to help us understand what the criteria for sort of analyzing or understanding this piece of art should be. In Critique of Judgment, he offers a strong starting statement uh, to understand what sets fine art apart. Section 46, aptly titled, Fine Art is the Art of Genius, Kant defines conditions for fine art. The first is genius, of course, which is a talent for producing that which no definite rule can be given. And of course, we understand these algorithms are being somewhat rules-based, and therefore perhaps lacking in this very genius that Kant, that Kant um, mentions. And that consequently, originality must be its primary property. How can one be original when it is de facto derivative of data sets of images? Second, it must be exemplary or not derived from imitation. Learning, in this case, deep learning, is nothing but a an extended, perhaps stochastically um, programmed, but form of imitation nonetheless. This may answer the question, but the German philosophers' 18th century ideas fail to transfer to our times because the talos of the image is different. When he builds his critique of aesthetics, he considers the image as an attempt to reflect natural beauty, or the appearance of being nature, as he calls it. He still sees the image as a screen. To assess the digital image properly and critically, we must ask, what is the image in and of itself? What is, it, what is its nature? We must eschew conversations of surface and to reveal the aim of the image, its essence. If the image is a map, as Flusser suggests, and this map is generated by neural networks, then what does the image reveal? What, does the, um, what, is, what has the essence of image to do with revealing? The answer, everything. Um, um, I can't help myself but uh, to, to do this little Heideggerian parallel here. Um, but the conclusion is that images are a technology. In the desire to congeal representation 73,000 years ago, to say that is that in that moment, we saw a challenge, a mountain to climb, 
to attain perfect representation of the world. One, could, one that could capture its minutiae, all that was at one, uh, at one moment and in one place. John Tagg in his collection, The Burden Representation, Essays on Photography and History, recounts how with the invention of the railroad, individuals were exposed to um, an accelerated um, um, view of live images and landscapes. And it left them in a daze. He writes, the, rapid, the rapidity and variety of the impressions necessarily fatigue both the eye and the brain. Studying the same passage in the book, The Social Photo, um, Nathan Jurgensen surmised that the dizzying feeling engenders fatigue. I reckon it's not fatigue that you feel when you see a bunch of images, but a, a variety or drunkenness. We drink the images. We are addicted to images. The goal of the image is to proliferate, and we have become its servile host. A proper philosophy of the AI image should address not its technical prowess or its potential initial applications, but the tension between image and being. The AI image defers from earlier images in that it ritualizes something completely different. As Flusser explains, the first images, the prehistoric ones, originated as ritualizations of myth, the connections between deities and humans. The second ritualizations in the age of photography, like with your cameras and stuff, is out of programs. The programs is, is the, the connection between um, the human and the machine. What is ritualized in the AI image is the network, the connection between data and computation. This third ritualization is the synthesis of the two previous ones. Networks are the products of myths and programs, a new entity we observe without complete understanding. As you may have mentioned, there's still somewhat of a black box. We put the input, something happens, and we get the output. But we're somewhat alienated from this thing that happens in the middle. They represent the dissolution of the modern barrier between text and image. The, revoc the revocation of the dualism between idolatry, the love of images, and logolatry, the love of language. Benjamin Bratton, in his lecture, The Synthetic and the Real, notes by way of Simon that the difference between the artificial and the synthetic is that the artificial implies deception, it pretends, like the zirconium pretending to be a diamond. On the other hand, the synthetic is deliberately created, such as the lab-grown lab diamond. Where do these new images stand? In an utter rejection of this binary, the AI image is both. Through its program, it seeks to be believable enough to deceive. Reminder that the Turing test is not based on intelligence, intelligence itself, but the deception of the human agent. But still, by the virtue of its material characteristics, or digital characteristics rather, it is still an image, just one composed in a new, in a new way. They join both, both gestures to become synthetic, synthetic and artificial. It is then when the synthetic and the artificial merge, that the telos of the image is revealed. For what does the image want to be, but no longer questioned? To finally be recognized as the final screen to evade all criticism. The image wants to emancipate itself from its maker. The image, like information, wants to be free. David Runnick, in his 2022 talk at Fest with Eric Hugh, noted that a new generation of image viewers will grow up in a world where most of the images they see will be AI generated. And to whom, because of their upbringing, the value of the human image will no longer rely on the artist or the photographer, but rather on the image as a standalone object. As a part of this research, I mapped out the moment of this pictorial singularity when there would be more AI-generated images than human images. I used a paper from Vila Lobos et al, um, where they show that there are, um, screen, big number of images, and the amount we generate today with YouTube, um, Facebook, Instagram. Um, if AI models generate in 2022, 10 million images per day, DALI produces about, produced about two at the time, two million, uh, with a 50% growth rate, <coughs> and we produce, uh, about eight with 
12 or two to with 13 zeros a day, um, the flippening would happen about 22 years. And uh, you can imagine a chart where we grow linearly and AI models, and 22 years is the point of that flippening. This pictorial flippening will also represent the point at which the images in the data set, unless selected otherwise, will a majority be from AI-generated images. We call this model collapse. Thus making the models recursive, mirrors of the own, their own creation. The artificial will no longer try to mimic the human-made, but this new amalgam of network-made and human-made. The blurring will be complete, and the modern world will be precipitated into a permanent state of hyperreal where images will no longer be tethered to their human maker. To ritualize a network is to ritualize the communications between machines and machines. It is to ritualize human images made for and by machines. It is to imagine a visual world no longer centered on humans. And this world is the telos of the image, hence their treachery. Thank you.